thank you all for joining us on Public Square. And I wanted to start with Amber and Flora. Could you share your experiences with us? I was with my ex-husband. Uh, we had met when we were about 15 years old. Um, we got married when we were 20. And um, to be quite honest, the domestic violence did not start until our honeymoon. And that was the first time he hit me. I would always report it. When it would happen, I would call the police, but I would back out on the restraining order. I would not show up. I would, you know, do that type of things. But um, once the Domestic Violence Resource Center kind of got hold of me and the detectives that came out on the last event that happened, it really just changed my whole perspective on what exactly I was going through. Why is that? Talk about that. Um, anybody who knew us was like, wow, you guys are such a great couple. You guys look so happy. But nobody knew as soon as that door closed, it was it was horrible in our house. It, it, for me, I was terrorized almost every single night. I knew once everybody knew I couldn't go back anymore. Nobody would let me. <laughs> Why did you stay so long, can I ask? Once it got bad enough where I felt like I needed to leave, I had the the kids and a lot of threats that he would burn my grandmother's house down while she was asleep. So to me, I knew that if I just told him what he wanted, he would eventually quit hitting me, but I didn't know what kind of control I would have if I wasn't in the situation. If my children went with him, I didn't know if he would harm, he never harmed them in front of me, so I didn't know if he would do it behind closed doors. He knew where everybody in my family lived, so I didn't really have anywhere to go that I could know that he wouldn't start knocking on everybody's doors. You, were you afraid he was gonna kill you? Oh, absolutely, every day. Every day I woke up and I, and I would say, I hope today is not the day. Talk about your kids, Did they were they there when he would hit you or do these things? I mean, they were there, but they were asleep. He was very good at hiding things. Um, he would, sometimes we would be in the middle of an argument in our room and he would say, hold on, and he would go and check and make sure the kids were asleep. He'd come back and as soon as he would shut that door and lock it, I knew that they were asleep and that he would possibly harm me and that's exactly what he would do. And so later on, once he left and going through counseling, the kids never said they heard, but they did see the aftermath, black eyes, fat lips, scratches, bite marks, and unfortunately I was uh, very good at deceiving everybody and you know, making up stories. Oh, I opened a cabinet, or I fell, or the baby did it, or you know, just horrible lies, but I was trying to protect him. Flor, can I ask you about your experience? Yes, so I got in a relationship with a older man, you know, and I was with him for two months, and I, I started noticing that something happened because he, uh, he wanted it to control me. He started uh, telling me stuff like, you know, I'm gonna call immigration for you. I'm gonna go on to the school and look for the kids. I'm gonna take him. And I was like, what are you telling me this? And he said, because I want to you marry me. I lost my job because of him, because he was uh, stalking me so much. Uh, he called me 900 times in one day. Uh, are you kidding? And later on, I find out he was an ex-military guy. He, uh, he took us uh, for a visit to, the, to his house, and he showed uh, guns to my kids. Like, I'm talking about 15 to 20 weapons. He told me, you know, the only way I can stop stalking you it's like if you make a restraining order i said okay i'm going to told you that yes and i did i took i get the restraining order for him for 3 years how long ago was this a year ago okay mm -hmm. how did it impact your kids he impacted my kids really 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 bad in the point that we are afraid we have to leave the house i have four kids you know i'm a single mother my 9 year old right now he's in a special education my 12-year-old, uh, it's in counseling for depression. And then my daughter, which is 16 years old, she's very, very afraid to have a relationship with uh, somebody. Do you, is that similar to your situation, Amber, or was it different because you sort of kept the, these well, things away from the kids so they didn't know? One of them was more upset with, why didn't you tell us? We could have protected you, we could have helped you. We could have done something. So she was kind of angry with me. And she's now at that age where dating, and she doesn't want to do it. She's terrified. 
My other daughter, unfortunately, she was so attached to her dad that she was very angry with me. Mm. You know, why do you make my dad leave? He didn't really hurt you. We never saw anything, you know. So after years of counseling and her finally understanding, she's more in a stage now where she's just attached to me. She feels very bad for being so angry with me. And I think the two oldest do to protect me, you know, have you ate, are you okay, are you warm, or how's your back feel, are you, you know, they do a lot of that, and so I have to kind of draw it back and say, be kids, and, and let me take on that responsibility, because it's hard for them to be without a father figure that they had for so long. Did you ever have an injury that you went to the hospital for? Oh, absolutely. Almost every time he would, he, um, when I was pregnant, he knocked out two of my teeth. Um, broke my nose. I had a um, torn retina in my eye. Um, he chipped the bone in my cheekbone. Um, this is all with his fists. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The last incident was with a gun though. And I never saw it coming. He, so he cold cocked you with the butt of a gun? Absolutely. And what was the effect of that? It fractured three of the bones in my neck and a little piece of the bottom of my skull. Did you go to the hospital? Um, yeah, he, he dropped me off in the front of the hospital. He did? Yeah. What did you tell them? That I got in a fight at a bar. Okay. Did they believe you? No. They didn't believe you? No. But they didn't report anything? No. Okay. Nobody ever did. Well, let me turn to Claudia and Lynn. What are the obligations here in terms of how things have evolved in terms of reporting? I don't see the same kind of responsibility. I don't see the laws making uh, medical personnel to do the reporting when it's an adult victim. When it's a child victim, it's mandatory and you have to do the reporting. When we start working with a victim, we never require that they report or we never report for them. We work with them, we talk with them, we offer to bring in detectives that they can talk to without fear of having to report. I'm happy to say that within the Family Advocacy Center and our victims, we have about a 90% reporting rate, and statewide it's about 46%. Why do you so think that's true? I think it's true because we're in a very comfortable, home-like environment. The police will come over, they'll talk with them, tell them their obligations, what's going to happen if they choose to report, and that they don't have to report, and, and they build a rapport with the victim. In the case of immigrant victims of domestic violence, they are very afraid to report to the police for fear that the police is going to report her to immigration and customs uh, officers. Why did you decide to follow the process through, Flora? It be a long process, but I decided that because uh, I found this organization, which is a very good organization. They back you up with a lot of services. They told me, you know, don't be afraid. She's do it. We're going to be with you. and. That's what happened, they were always with, you know, with me. Claudia, speak a little bit about VAWA and it's uh, the, the law, federal law, as it relates to immigrant victims, because yeah. I think that's important. Uh, yeah, the Violence okay. Against Women Act that passed in 94 and has been reauthorized many times, uh, was created to protect all women victims of domestic violence, but in particular immigrant women, because the uh, Congress understood that immigrant women uh, were uh, more uh, vulnerable to the perpetrator. The perpetrator used their immigration status as another weapon to control them. An expansion of what Claudia is saying mm -hmm. is, is the threat that is used against uh, immigrant victims is that they will never see their children again. Mm -hmm. So if he is a citizen and she is not, they have children together or she has he is going to report her and he's going to use the idea that she will never see her children again. It's a very, very powerful weapon. Beverly, um, I know that this cuts across all socioeconomic, <laughs> all cultural sectors. Domestic violence is particularly high in Native America. Are there extra barriers to Native women seeking help? There have been all along uh, in terms of the available resources in the community, in any particular community, that's tribal communities nationwide. But, uh, and there was until the recent passage of VAWA, or reauthorization of VAWA, it includes Native women and allowing tribal nations or tribal court systems to actually prosecute 
non-natives in that community or non-tribal members because until then, uh, because of the special agreement with uh, the government, uh, tribal communities didn't have that authorization. They couldn't try people who were non-natives in their community. They, they had to call in the FBI and only if there was a serious injury. Talk about the relationship between the mother and the child and what happens to the mother might affect the child. In the state of New Mexico, being a witness to domestic violence as a child is child abuse by law. Yeah. That's a pretty powerful tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just used as often as it could be. I think for children, um, I, I was a child victim myself, and when what I saw was um, I believed that everything that occurred in my house was occurring in every house. To think that this was not normal uh, it was too overwhelming and too frightening. Um, so I think that part of the problem is that the, the biggest problem for children growing up in that environment is they define normal by that. And that has uh, unbelievable effects moving forward. It does. One of the things that um, we see with children that have uh, witnessed violence or children who were violated themselves and grow up to be adults, the outcomes are depression, anxiety, PTSD. Um, it can be somatic symptoms um, where they have pain disorders, um, eating disorders, all sorts of things. And so I, I guess my question to you I, it just, you, I know that you're in therapy and I commend you for that. It's wonderful. Um, and I'm wondering, are you also in therapy? Oh, I can't yeah. imagine eight years. I, I started seeing someone and she just helped me so much and, and the kids like I went directly to their schools, contacted their counselors, you know, um, did whatever I could do to make sure because I didn't know what they saw, what they knew, what if he had ever done anything to them and told them don't you tell your mother, you know what I mean? I didn't know the extent of it so we definitely all of us have been seeing counselors and getting help for it. And it, compared to where we were three years ago, you would never think that something like this would happen. Like they are doing so well and I'm so grateful for that. One of the things that we see is that the children tend to grow up before their time. Yes. They become the adult. They become responsible for everything that's happening. And Amber did a great job of describing it a little bit, saying, let me get you a blanket. Are you cold? Is this? But they truly believe they are responsible for the violence or the peace in the house. The other thing that we see and, and, and notice is the education system. Talk um, about that. What do you mean? If you have a child at home that has just seen one of his parents or his siblings hurt the night before, they are not in a mode to go learn. Mm -hmm. The only thing they are concentrating on is what happened the night before or what's going to happen tonight when I go home. We're eighth in the nation per capita for domestic violence. And so I think that there's a direct correlation to our education system and our graduation rates. These children are not in a condition to learn. Last year there was a study about educational achievement of children who have witnessed domestic violence. They realized that kids that are in domestic violence have like 10 or um, 15 points lower IQ than the kids that don't witness domestic violence. In addition, by third grade, they are behind in reading and in math. What does that mean in terms of it being a cause for other societal problems. Well, witnessing violence itself rewires the brain. It activates the part of our brain that's fight or flight. And that part of our brain of fight or flight is so much stronger for survival that it literally is shutting down other parts of the brain that would produce algebra, poetry, music. Those parts of the brains are is frozen in time. Through the healing process, the brain has to rewire itself again. And it is it has got a direct impact on our schools. It has a direct impact on criminality and, and, and the intergenerational effects is that we have to have space and time to heal and, and an understanding that this is not just a psychological issue. This is a, a holistic body issue when you're fighting for your life in your own home.
Trish, you work with perpetrators. Yes. Um, how many of them, what, can, what percentage do you have gone through this as kids? Oh, 60 to 70 percent easily have witnessed domestic violence themselves um, in that whole space of what's normal. It is actually integrated into their system of belief that this is how the world operates and that they are in charge of their world. Yeah. You know, They're, if yeah. my world as I see it is not normal and right. I'm four, right. How do, how do you cope with that? It's a crazy system inside of our brains, really, because there's a part that they grew up in. This is how we live. This is how women get controlled. This is how I run my household. This is what makes me a man. But there's another part of this perspective when you ask them in treatment groups, did you witness domestic violence? And the child in them can definitely relate, even as a batterer, to the pain that they experienced as a child. Mm -hmm. So there is, I mean, it goes but back to that. But they're not making those connections? They're not making no. that connection, no. And a lot of it has to do with that, that rewiring of the brain that we're talking about. Literally, those two parts of the brain did not reconcile. But they do remember being a child. and the fear that they had. Now sometimes they integrate that into anger towards their mother, which you know the women talked about. They, there was this confusion. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, I used to do a run a group for middle school students and I was invited to do a presentation on anger management for a local charter school and a lot of the children that were attending were at-risk students. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, a, I wrote anger on the blackboard and I asked What's the first word that comes to mind when you see this word? Every single student said hitting, punching, kicking, guns, knives. And that goes back to what she said. Mm -hmm. They never learn the, the connection between action and emotion. They become one in the same. I see the children that I see in private practice with that are children of trauma. They're stuck in, in the fear and in trying to save their mom, mm -hmm. and they have and they're guilt-ridden over being angry at their dad, or being angry that they don't know what they feel. So how do you rewire an adult brain that has gone through that? A lot of the trauma work that I do is helping adults reclaim that child that was stuck in giving them permission to say, I was terrorized, I was hurt, I have a right to cry. This did happen, remember the trauma, because a lot of times they go through lifetime trying to forget. And if people don't get help, it just perpetuates, oh, yeah. so it goes it's on sad. and on and on. And so that's why it's really important for PCPs, primary care mm -hmm. providers, um, to do an assessment for child abuse, for violence, all these different things. You mean on children or on adults? On adults and oh. children, but definitely adults. It's not done. When you have 15 minutes to see a patient, that's it. You can deal with maybe one issue, so they're not really looking for that. And in the literature, it says that very plainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But really, the primary way to get offenders to break that cycle of their own thinking patterns is through the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Very few batterers self-identify mm -hmm. into treatment. So in your program, it, are they court ordered in? Absolutely. It is a very necessary component to sort of waking up the brain to say something's not right and why is this against the law? I run several different types of batterer programs, and there is a distinct difference between them. I have a, a program that we run that's from the Metropolitan Court called the Domestic Violence Repeat Offenders Program. And there is a carrot and a stick to say, you're not going to get the felony if you actually complete this program. And it's a very intensive program. This is not six sessions. It takes a very long time to rewire that brain. Mm -hmm. But when that shift happens, what we see is that there's more longer lasting effects where they're not going to re-enter into the system. The other group of folks that doesn't have the same carrot and stick, they can drop in and out of treatment many times before they get it. And every time they drop in and out of treatment, that's another victim. That's another opportunity for a child to be damaged. I think that we won't eliminate domestic violence unless we work to equalize the power between men and women. It's a gender inequality mentality. We have to create awareness that 
the social norms that accept violence need to be removed and change those social norms for social norms that are intolerant to violence. When I was a kid, everybody used to smoke in houses with kids around, etc. There was little by little this infusion of media telling you smoking is wrong. Well, the same thing has to happen with domestic violence. Is there a way to involve the faith community to get that message out? I think that there's a myth out there that the upper management of the church encourages men to be in dominant over their families. But nowhere in the Bible or nowhere in Catholic teaching does it say that men abuse their wives or wives abuse their husbands. On the contrary, when they take the vow, they're saying that they're gonna honor their wife and the wife is gonna honor her husband. I really think that um, uh, Michael Sheehan has done a great job. In what way? He has made a point of making that something during Domestic Violence Awareness Month to talk about that. The Family Life Education Program at the Archdiocese says not only is this not okay, it's seriously not okay. Uh, and as a Jewish person, I just would say um, that I really am proud of what he's done. And I appreciate what you're saying because I think a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And this is a huge change of thought from generation to generation. I think we have to be careful about gender in saying yes. that it's always a man that's the offender and always a woman that is the victim because 13% yes. of our victims are male. Wow. And so I don't think it's a gender issue so much as the societal issue, um, learned behavior in your home. And so we need to be really careful mm -hmm. of what we look at and what we perceive I think it's important for me when I think about victims of uh, interpersonal violence, I think about all the paths across which that person walks. And that is what we did to build the Family Advocacy Center was to do that, it was to take the touchstones and say, what, do we, what can we do together that will really move the needle in service delivery to victims? We're gonna move on to our next section and add in some of our leadership folks and we'll continue talking about this.